The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Our first lesson from the Book of Acts um, is my preaching text today, and it comes at the end of a dramatic series of events. So I need to offer you a bit of background. At the beginning of chapter 10 of Acts, we meet Cornelius, a devout and prayerful, prayerful Gentile, not a Jew, like Peter. Cornelius, a centurion in the Roman army shortly before the death of Jesus, had a vision in which an angel told him to send some of his men to find a man called Peter and bring him to Cornelius. Meanwhile, Peter, the main leader of this new Jesus movement, had a vision of his own. One day, while he was waiting for his lunch, he saw the heavens open and a big sheet floated down from the sky, filled with all sorts of animals that faithful Jews were not permitted to eat. But Peter then heard a voice say something like, go ahead and eat. And that's when Cornelius' soldiers showed up at Peter's door and persuaded him to come with them. Once they arrived at Cornelius' house, Peter started to preach the gospel. But then something surprising happened, which is, where today's first lesson kicks in. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came up on everyone, even the Gentiles. And Peter wondered out loud, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who, like us, have received the Holy Spirit, both Jews and Gentiles? Now let me take you back about 100 years ago here in the United States when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president in 1932 in the midst of the Great Depression. Not long after his inauguration, a friend came to see FDR in the Oval Office and said something like this. 
Mr. President, if you succeed in solving the crisis of the Great Depression, you will go down in history as our greatest president. But if you fail, sir, you will go down as our worst. And to this, FDR responded, if I fail, I'll be the last. There are moments in the life of every individual and organization, from people to families to churches to countries, when the stakes are so high and the challenges are so significant that survival itself is on the line. We call these existential crises. Sometimes we are lucky to recognize these moments, to be aware, as Roosevelt was, of just how serious the situation is. And other times, we only realize in hindsight just how close we came to losing everything. When we read these stories and acts about the formation of the early church, it's obvious to us just how close this early Christian movement came to never getting off the ground, much less becoming a religion that would shape the world for centuries to come. But those who were there, those first Jesus followers, probably had no idea of the weight of the decisions they were making. Decisions like whether to stay behind locked doors or to go out among God's people. Decisions like whether to share the gospel <coughs> with Jews only or to expand the gospel to everyone. Decisions like whether following Jesus was more important than following the Jewish rules and, and so on. Although the answers to these questions may seem obvious to us now, for those first Jesus followers, there was nothing easy or obvious about those decisions at all. This was especially true for Peter, who is not just any disciple. He was the one that Jesus himself said would lead the church at first. From the very beginning of Acts, we see why Jesus chose Peter. He was a gifted preacher, and he was a wise and discerning leader. It was Peter who recognized that the Holy Spirit was causing the chaos of the first Pentecost. It was Peter who was not afraid to speak on behalf of all the other disciples. It was Peter who believed enough in the power of God that he could cure the sick and even raised someone from the dead. In today's story, we also discover that Peter had a gift for what we now call adaptive leadership. Adapted, adaptive leadership, a term coined by theologian Penn Perry to describe leadership that responds to emerging challenges that have no clear-cut solutions. As much as the events in today's passage must have shocked Peter, first that vision that overturns centuries-old Jewish food laws, and then the invitation <coughs> to enter the house of a Gentile, imagine that. Peter still kept going, trusting in the Holy Spirit to lead him into an unknown future. Peter going into Cornelius' house might not sound like such a big deal to us today, but this is among the most significant encounters in all of the book of Acts. 
Since Jews and Gentiles did not interact socially, it would have been perfectly acceptable, even preferable, for Peter to say to Cornelius's men, I'm sorry, but no, I, I can't go with you today. There have been too many new things already, too many challenges to the status quo, and the laws and traditions about my interacting with you and Cornelius are very clear. No, I just can't do it. But this isn't what Peter says. He says, yes, and enters the home of a Gentile to share the good news of God's love revealed in Jesus Christ, extending God's love to an entirely new group of people. Peter says yes before he before he knows how it's going to turn out or what it will mean to the future of the church. You don't have to spend much time in any church to know that churches tend to attract people who want to do the right thing and have the right answer. People who want to know what the rules are and to follow the rules and make sure that others follow them too. We church folk appreciate order and clearly defined responsibilities, which means that Peter, like most of us at one time or another in the course of being part of the church, will come up against some questions that challenge our basic assumptions and, our, and defy easy answers. Questions like, Will the church be able to maintain a place of relevance in our culture? Who will want to be part of our community? And will we be open to including them? And how can we bridge the differences between generations in a way that honors our past and moves us into the future? Those are questions that we still struggle with today. You know, if, if church leadership were easy, there wouldn't be all kinds of resources devoted to it. Things like books and videos and coaches and consultants, most of which take complex issues and boil them down to tools that, if followed, will produce the de desired result, uh, whether they are seven effective habits or four quadrants of productivity or five characteristics of an effective ministry team or 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. And until chapter 10 of Acts, we could be forgiven for thinking that it is Peter who made the church the church, or for assuming that it is us who must make sure that the church stays the church. But this story makes it clear that the church didn't become the church because of Peter or Paul or any other of the disciples and apostles. The church didn't become the church because of the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, who insisted that God's promises were for them too. What made the church the church and what keeps the church the church is the Holy Spirit, whose coming we will celebrate at Pentecost two weeks from now. When Peter starts preaching to Cornelius and his household, the Holy Spirit, if you notice it there in the first lesson, the Holy Spirit cuts him off. Then, for the first time in Acts, the Holy Spirit shows up and pours itself out on the Gentiles, a whole new set of people. Not when they are baptized, 
or after they are baptized, but before they are baptized. Imagine that. Which is why Peter asks, asks the rhetorical, rhetorical question, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit, who have already received the Holy Spirit? Clearly, the answer is no. And it's at this moment that we realize that Peter is not the main character in the book of Acts, and no human being is. The main character of Acts, the primary leader of the church, then and now, as you probably guessed, is the Holy Spirit. And that means that this Jesus movement is not about Peter or about us, our words, our wisdom, our abilities. It's about God's word, Jesus, and God's wisdom, the Holy Spirit, and God's ability to move us beyond our limited vision of who God is and who we are called to be as God's church. It's a comfort to me, and it may be to you as well, that it is when Peter is doing what he does best, and that is preaching, that the Holy Spirit cuts him off, making it very clear that this movement is about so much more than whoever is the leader of any church. And I hope it's a, a comfort to you as it is to me that leadership in the church is not about having all the answers or following all the rules. Leadership in the church is about letting go of our assumptions and agendas and allowing the Spirit of God to move in our midst. And sometimes that means to interrupt. Sometimes it means to disrupt. And sometimes it means to pour out on the last people we would ever suspect God to choose as leaders, even people like us. When she was in seminary, the eminent theologian and author Barbara Brown Taylor was told this. Being ordained as a pastor is not about serving God perfectly, but about serving God visibly, allowing other people to learn what they can from watching you rise and fall. You probably won't be much worse than other pastors, she was told, and you certainly won't be any better, but you will have to let people look at you you will have to let them see you as you are. To this, Barbara Brown Taylor added, if it was up to me, every person who joined a church, and especially those who took on a position of leadership, would have to answer this one question. Will you let people see you, even and especially when you don't have the right answer or you've made a mistake, even, especially when you feel the, the spirit moving you in a direction that you'd rather not go. You know, it's so tempting for us to make leadership in the church about our talents, our abilities, our knowledge. It's tempting, but it's wrong. Because really, the only job of church leaders is to be followers, followers of the unpredictable, erratic, and sometimes shocking movement of the Holy Spirit, which is, after all, the presence of God in the here and now. Which we can pretty much guarantee that the Spirit will push and prod and 
pull us to go places we never imagined we would go. Even places we don't want to go. And while that might sound much harder than following a rule book, the good news is that when we are willing to follow, the Spirit will lead us in a direction into a future we could never predict, but where we will experience the boundary-breaking, custom-defying, all-encompassing love of God. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>